I, um, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, putting me first so that I can enjoy the rest of the conference. So uh, I'm also uh, grateful to Stanford and the It From Cubit collaboration uh, that Simons is putting on for uh, paying for me. And in 2019, I'm joining Cambridge as a lecturer. All right, so the second law of thermodynamics uh, as you know, says that the entropy, S, is increasing with time for any closed system. Now, that closed bit is a pretty important uh, caveat because in an open system, there's something else entropy can do, which is it can just leave. And if it just leaves, it lowers the entropy of the system. So, pretty obvious point but uh, it's important to each of us because we are open systems and if our entropy couldn't go down, we'd quickly be dead. So, one question that really launched a lot of this subject is what form does the second law of thermodynamics take in a universe that has gravity? This uh, requires us to start thinking about curved space time, and I thought maybe it would be helpful to start by saying what the obvious way of stating the second law is, because it's not the form that turns out to be the most profound one. So, one thing about a curved space time is we no longer have a unique notion of simultaneity. There are many different ways of picking uh, sort of slicing space-time into space at one time that wiggle, you can pick any space-like surface you like. But we could say, okay, it doesn't matter how we pick it. We pick this time slice at one time, T1, it's called a Cauchy slice. We can define the entropy of all the matter at that time, and then we could pick another Cauchy slice at later time, everywhere to the future, we'll call that time 2, and these are supposed to be complete slices that include all of space. And when we've done that, we then will say that the second law uh, is the statement that the entropy on the second slice, suitably coarse-grained or whatever, is greater than the entropy of the initial slice. Now, I know it's various fine print that goes into this about exactly what information you forget to, or, or coarse grain over, as it's called, and what initial conditions you sort of have to assume the universe began in a low entropy state in order to uh, be able to derive, even in a hand waving sense, the second law. But given all of these usual stipulations that are probably more or less the same as a non gravitational system, this is how you might have thought the second law would behave. But once you bring in black holes, there's an interesting implication of this or, or puzzle that uh, John Wheeler originally uh, set as a problem to uh, Bekenstein, which is that. Uh, normally, the second law is taken to rule out perpetual motion machines. But if you have a black hole, classically, uh, the story ends up changing quantum mechanically, but classically, there's an, uh, a black hole is like a sink that you can dump an arbitrary amount of entropy into. So if you only want to talk about the information that is outside the black hole, it seems like in theory, or so it seemed, you could make a uh, perpetual motion machine by some clever cycle where, where you, you uh, whenever you have excess entropy, you dump it into the black hole, and then you extract useful work forever and ever. So that doesn't actually contradict the second law in the form I just told you about, because if you take complete time slices, they extend into the black hole, and so they are, um, they are, uh, will count the entropy of things that fell in, but it's kind of strange that you could design a perpetual motion machine. Now, from the perspective of solving all of humanity's energy needs, this might be a good thing, but uh, it should make us suspicious if you can evade a cherished principle of physics uh, so easily. You can tell if you have a theoretical physicist, if you say, you know, there's a second law violation in your theory, and they say, oh, no, instead of what an ordinary person would say, which is, oh, good. <laughs> but um, the... Uh, 
The, so this led Bekenstein and uh, Hawking to propose uh, a generalization of the second law, which is now known to apply more generally, not just to event horizons, but to any causal horizon. So the event horizon of a black hole is the boundary of the region that can escape out to infinity. So it's a surface that uh, moves outwards at the speed of light, so if you cross it, you, you can never escape, and yet even though it's moving outwards at the speed of light, the black hole isn't, get, it isn't getting any bigger um, when the black hole isn't growing. So one example of a causal horizon is the event horizon with the black hole, but you can define a more general definition as the boundary of the past of any world line, any observer, if you will, who lives forever to the future. And then you take the whole region of space-time they can see, and if there's a boundary, that's a causal horizon. So other examples are in cosmology, at late times, the universe is accelerating. We expect there to be the sitter-like cosmological horizons. And even in ordinary uh, vacuum Minkowski space-time, if you got into a spaceship and accelerated indefinitely, you, uh, uniformly, there would be a boundary of what can reach you, and that's called a Rindler horizon. All of these actually obey analogous laws of thermodynamics. So black holes is just sort of an example of a bigger phenomenon that is also important to, say, this room, because there's Rindler horizons going through us right now. So the generalized second law states that you need to add an extra term to count for the entry of the black hole, and it's equal to the area of the event horizon. So it says the term proportional to the area of the causal horizon plus the ordinary matter entropy of the matter outside increases with time. Note there's no term for the matter inside the black hole. That's just supposed to be somehow covered or uh, uh, replaced by the area of the horizon. Now, one piece of evidence for this is that in uh, classical general relativity, uh, there's a theorem proven by Stephen Hawking, and in this classical regime, the area term is the one that's dominant, and he proved that the area of a black hole event horizon is always increasing with time. He proved this before he proposed black hole thermodynamics, so he didn't know the uh, true significance of this. He just thought the paper title is something like a bound on the gravitational radiation emitted by black holes or something like that. But basically, if you assume that energies are positive, which is reasonably classical, which is reasonable classically, the area of the horizon is increasing with time. But quantum mechanically, the key point is that black holes have a temperature. They Hawking radiate. There's radiation that comes from just outside the horizon. And so you can do thermodynamic experiments, and the black hole Hawking radiates. Uh, it emits energy and entropy, but you could also dump things in, and no matter how people tried to do these experiments, they always found that the sum of these two terms increases. Uh, and you can work out what the entropy of a black hole is using the Clausius relation, uh, since you know the temperature of the Hawking radiation. So the Clausius relation is DE equals TDS, uh, often taken as the definition, the thing you use to find the entropy. And when you work out this equation, you find that the entropy is again proportional to the area. Now note, it's the Hawking radiation that makes it so we can't actually make the perpetual motion machine. The classical mistake was thinking the black hole has exactly zero temperature. In fact, it does not. So here's a somewhat more precise statement of the generalized second law. Um, here's a diagram where light travels at 45 degrees. And the, you make partial Cauchy slices that describe the region outside you, that's seen by the observer. So as we go up in time, we're restricting to less and less information. And the generalized entropy, which is the sum of the area over four uh, Newton's constant, Planck's constant, plus the entropy of stuff outside, that's what's increasing with time. And we call that the generalized second law. One funny thing about this is that in quantum field theory, you get contributions to the entanglement, even in the vacuum, which naively actually are infinity, just like everything else in quantum field theory, very close to the boundary. So you've got to tell a story to deal with that. You've got to uh, 
If you have your slice, you can chop it into two regions, the inside and the outside. You can define an entropy in the usual way you do it in quantum uh, mechanics by thinking about the density matrix rho of the matter. This is just the standard formula for the entropy, the von Neumann entropy in quantum mechanics. Um, but it's divergent, and so you actually have to deal with that by saying any divergences in the entropy outside are compensated for by sort of renormalization or rescaling of the Newton's constant itself. So just like everything else in physics, you have to renormalize, but normally the, there's a question of what's going on at the shortest distance scales. Now, I told you before that um, people had checked this generalized second law in a lot of Gedanken experiments, special cases. Um, it's now been uh, proven in uh, various regimes um, that this is true for general quantum field theory states. Um, the first really good proof was the one of Frolov and Page, but they did it as an S matrix sense, so they could only prove that in some process the very late time and generalized entropy is greater than the very early time generalized entropy. Uh, it basically, my dissertation work was showing how to prove that the generalized entropy actually increases incrementally 